Welcome to Hey, Great Shot. This is the Great Shot Podcast, a Crack Rackets and Tennis Channel Podcast Network production. My name is Alex Gruskin. On tonight's show, we've got another live edition of The Deciding Point, our weekly breakdown of everything happening across the Division I college tennis world. Of course, here on Tuesday nights, we break down the Division I women's action. I might shed a tear as I say the next statement, week 13 of the 2024 season now officially in the books. This upcoming weekend is the final weekend of regular season conference play in far, far too many conferences across the country. Another round of senior days to get all of us college tennis fans emotional, of course. This is one of the final classes, dare I say, the final class we've had five years with. And so certainly we will all be feeling the impact when this class leaves in 2025. That said, we we still get another month and change with this group. Certainly all looking forward to the NCAA tournament on the horizon. Before we get there, we got to break down another busy weekend of results from across the country. Obviously, again, every result at this point with NCAA significance. We're fighting for top eight, top 16 seeds, places in the tournament. Overall, of course, regular season titles on the line across the country. As such, given those stakes, certainly I think this past weekend of results delivered. We had top seeds earning signature victories, teams in the top 16 conversation getting upset, and so much more. It is is going to be a jam-packed podcast for all of you listeners today. One of those shows that makes me so grateful. I have the man to my left joining me here tonight as he joins me and has joined me each and every week of this 2024 season. Of course, he's a man you all know best as the returning champion of returning champions here on our Crack Rackets podcast, founder of the No Ad No Problem blog and podcast, of course, our on-the-ground reporter for so much that's happened throughout the course of this 2024 season. And most importantly, it's my dear friend, John J. Parsons, joining us once again in what CR producer Daniel Westoff pointed out is a very snazzy shirt, my friend. John J. Parsons, hey, great shot. Welcome back to the show. Week 13 in the books. Are you feeling emotional like I am? This senior day actually really hit me yeah. because, one, it always comes up so fast. I saw also... the tweet. Oh, did, of did I... most notable senior oh, days. Yeah, I thought it was I mean, a this... great tweet. Yeah, it was really historic, right? Because we have so many of these large classes because you have guys that and girls that are leaving after four years and then people who had stayed for five. So you have really large classes who have accomplished really historic things. And if you are someone who doesn't like change, that can be <laughs> tough. And also knowing what's on the horizon in college tennis and college athletics more broadly. By the way, we have a second NCAA individual tournament this fall. Like there's just a lot of moving parts happening across college tennis and certainly the, the departure of so many of these players. It didn't make me cry, but it was, like, <laughs> uh, sentimental for sure. Yeah, no, you mentioned it in your tweet, the UNC class that obviously won four national indoor titles, the first NCAA title in program history, the NC State class that reached the first NCAA final, first ACC title. How about the Texas seniors, Shavatapan and Rapalu? They were a part yeah. of those back-to-back -back national championship teams in 21-22. They're in their final year of eligibility as well. All the super seniors spread out across the country as well who we've had for half a decade you do anything for half a decade dare I say at least half decently you will leave some sort of imprint some sort of legacy and you're absolutely right there does feel like there's a little bit more gravitas to these senior days given again the the list of accomplishments so many of these classes have achieved but Jay We'll save time for ruminating on where these classes belong in college tennis history for the offseason. We got a lot of good matches to get into. So many fun results from week number 13, including maybe the most accomplished senior class we have graduating across the country. The UNC Tar Heels, who, dare I say, John J. Parsons, for the first time here in this 2024 season, earn a capital S signature victory in Chapel Hill that has all of us wondering. Are the Tar Heels back with the NCAA tournament on the horizon? Of course, what did the Tar Heels do in on senior weekend in Chapel Hill? Not only the 4-0 uh, victory over Virginia Tech on Sunday in a lineup that, by the way, featured all six seniors on the UNC roster. 
I loved that. To see Forbes, McClure at those five and six spots, Tran healthy back in the lineup. That was just a cool little detail to throw in there for, again, a class that has accomplished so much. So kudos to Coach Calvis, Thompson, Carter for making that decision. But, you know, the win over Virginia Tech, that's not the capital S signature. That victory came in their win over number four at the time, Virginia, on Friday. A match that saw the Tar Heels lose the doubles point and pretty much nothing else. And that is where we start this conversation about are the Tar Heels back? Because, again, this was a team coming into the year I had Pantheon-level expectations for. I think we all did. They were bringing back the entire starting lineup of a team that won the national championship last year and was the end-to-end calendar favorite to do so. And you brought them all back, a year more experienced, a year more talented, a year more developed. Reese Brantmeyer wins the ITA Fall Nats. Her and Scotty, number one in the country in doubles. Obviously, she tears her meniscus at the National Indoor Championships. That's a big wrench thrown into this North Carolina season. But still, with the other returners they had back from last year, with the additions of uh, Theodora Rabman and Tatum Evans, who unred shirts herself and becomes eligible given that injury, you thought these Tar Heels would eventually perhaps find their footing. And yet, again, what makes this Friday victory so notable? This is the first time UNC looked like capital letters UNCJ. After losing the doubles point, dropping matches at the two and three spots, four straight set victories against a Virginia team that doesn't lose three straight set singles matches just about ever this year, let alone four of them. And for the Tar Heels to come out swinging the way they did, again, to win 6-1 first set from Crawley over Heba Shake at 1, 6-3 first sets at 2, 5, and 6, all pretty quickly as well. Again, this team ends up with four straight set victories, Crawley 1-2 and two at the top spot. That's her best result of the year, okay, no doubt about it. Uh, Riley Tran, 6-4-6 love, and to be clear, she was up 5-2 in that first set. Ziodato narrowed the gap to 5-4. Tran doesn't lose a game the rest of the way. 3-2 and two from Yarlagata over Chervinsky. I thought that was her best performance of the year, and to see her at that 5 spot, again, that's a little bit of an adjustment for the Tar Heels, given where she'd been playing early in the season. And then, again, the Maserati's out of the garage, and Elizabeth Scotty was down an early break in the second set, and yet three and four. She gets off the courts in straight sets again. They were also up 6-3, 5-2 at six. It looked like Carson Tangillig was going to force a third as she was down a set, but up 5-2 in the second at four. They were winning everywhere. This was the first comprehensive. We're clicking on all six cylinders in singles, and yes, they dropped the doubles point. But that's how a best team in the country responds at home. To get four straight set victories over a top five team, Jay, it begs the question, is North Carolina back? Well, it was certainly their best performance in the after Reese AR era (laughs) by far. And you could have shown me this result at the start of the season. And I would have said like, yeah, checks out. Seems like things are are tracking as we expected. This North Carolina team is just trekking along. Wow, they didn't even need, need Reese Brantmeyer. They're resting her for ACCs, and I would have believed you. So very impressive performance. It's a little tough to say that they're back because we just need more data points at this point. Like It's been really volatile since indoors. We have seen some semblance of things coming back, and then we've seen taking steps back. But by and large, it does feel... Like things are trending in the right direction, but we saw the hiccup against NC State only a few weeks ago. So it's tough to say they're fully back and they will never be back to expectations and they certainly will not be at the level with when they had Reese. So I'm not sure I'd go that far, but they are. This was the best performance of the season. They are not the first team in the inner circle. Oklahoma State undefeated has earned that benefit of the doubt. But they are firmly ensconced in the inner circle, and there's no doubt about their placement back in it after a performance like this. And look, I call the ACC every weekend, Friday, Sunday, ESPN+. Plus. It's our final broadcast this weekend. So, folks, please come join us, even if you have us on mute. I've seen the level of these ACC teams, and I think there are some in particular that have continued to improve. Like Miami, 
has still only played like 14 matches on the year, but that is a top 20, top 16 caliber team. We'll talk about Florida State a little bit later. I think they're in that category. Duke is a team we've talked about a lot of late. They continue to get better. I think Georgia Tech is nowhere near the lows of January. They are back to being the top 25, top 16 curious type team we thought they might be to start the season. This UNC group, even through struggles, has gotten wins over all of those teams over the past few months. And again, no one would accuse the Tar Heels of winning pretty prior to this match against Virginia. But that after going through, dare I say, the flames of those two months or six weeks of struggles and to come out for the first time with a fully healthy lineup, it feels like, and play this level of match, man, is it encouraging. And again, it feels like for half a decade, the conversation, maybe even a decade, was did the Tar Heels peak too soon? Did they peak in February? Can they sustain that level for the rest of the year? It is very refreshing, Jay, to have that not be the narrative surrounding this team. The fact that they're now peaking at the right time. The fact that, you know, again, they've only lost three matches. They revenge, get a little revenge over one of them in their win over Virginia, and it cannot be understated. That had to have been in their back of their minds, like this team embarrassed us at the National Indoors. Time to get a little bit of payback. They have an NC State problem. Like, that's really the only day. You talk about the lack of data points. Like, that's the only team who's gotten them, right? And so, you're right. Like, this is a team who maybe the postseason tournament matters to more than any of the other top contenders as we enter this postseason conference tournament swing. Because it's like, if they get through that at the pace that they got through this Virginia match, then maybe they do usurp Oklahoma State for that top spot entering the NCAA tournament because they'll have the NCAA experience going into it as well. It's just all the what-ifs are back on the table for this Tar Heel team, I guess, coming off of that. And back to the inside path, they're tied with Virginia for the lead for the regular season title, but they have the head-to-head victory. It's a little thing, but it's a nice little paycheck bonus for all the coaching staff, right, Jay? Yeah, I think they'll end up uh, assuming, I mean, Virginia still has tough matches this weekend yeah. against Miami and FSU. Uh, those are at home though, but so they could still get tripped up and North Carolina could run away with the conference title outright. But yeah, I mean, that's why I'm very curious to see North Carolina go into the postseason because this performance against Virginia looked elite. And if they can continue that, then the narrative shifts. Mm-hmm. So We'll have to continue to monitor, but a great performance. That's exactly it. It's the first time they looked elite. Also, Tran 3, Tangillig 4, Yarlagata 5, Evan 6. That's new. Like, oh, I, 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 did we see that against NC State? Maybe. Um, yeah, I guess Carson yeah. would have played 4 against that. But that and is Tran a, was at 3. Yeah, it's a little bit of a shift, though, from certainly the trends we saw early in the season from where things were in the Tar Heels singles lineup. But... Hey, man, you found four straight set victories. You were a game away from a fifth, and you flipped the sixth match. So, again, best performance, no doubt, for them on the season. Jay, let's flip from the Atlantic coast to the West Coast now as we head to our second topic here. And I think we got to go to Northern California where the lesson we learned coming out of Pepperdine's matches against Cal and Stanford is – Maybe the north side of the state's not for them, Jay. It was a tough weekend for the Waves as they drop both of their matches. Now, a loss at Stanford, no harm, no foul. That said, for Pepperdine to lose it in the fashion they did, they dropped doubles. They dropped two of the top three, including Janice Chen taking her first loss of the season. You know, again, that felt like a notable data point. And then for them to win doubles... And still lose 4-3 to a Cal team that was missing Valentina Ivanov, who we had seen play number one as recently as the weekend before for the Cal Bears. You know, again, it was a tough weekend for Pepperdine, who, by the way, I always want to point this fact out because a coach has made it noted to me how significant this is. They played these matches back to back Friday, Saturday, and I do think that's relevant when trying to simulate the NCAA environment to get those sorts of weekends in because a lot of time it's Friday, Sunday, right? And you have that day in between the traveling from Stanford to Berkeley and all the different things that come with that. Like it's, it's not easy to play back to back days in the regular season. That said, you know, again, they were up three, two in that Cal match, third sets for Brodus Campania. Uh, They weren't able to get over the hump there, Jay. It's, it was a tough weekend for the waves. What'd you learn most? Well, a lot of things. Uh, First, the Pac-12 often will play back-to-back. So I know Pepperdine is not in the Pac-12, and so they were the only team here that had to go 
back to back, but you saw uh, Stanford turn back around and have to play uh, Oregon. But normally they will do a Friday, Saturday often in the Pac-12. So this was a bad weekend for Pepperdine. Stock majorly fell for me on this Pepperdine team. A few things to note. One, Stanford was also without a top player in Alexis Blokina, was not in the lineup there for Stanford. So uh, you mentioned Ivanov out for Cal. This is the third time they've played. They dropped that match now without uh, Cal's number one player and having taken doubles. So not great. The biggest thing that's concerning for Pepperdine right now is Savannah Brodus is not healthy. She is, has a pretty big bandaged up leg and she's walking quite gingerly between points. So that is probably why she is struggling the way she is. We're not used to seeing her lose these matches. We also saw her get moved down to number three in that match against Cal, but she's definitely not a hundred percent. The second is that Lisa Czar is not having the results we thought she would uh, after some of her pro results. I mean, losing 0-1 to Villar Moeller at Cal is Can I push a, back, pretty though? shocking. This, like, I agree just on that Czar point per, in particular because that's hor- like that's a bad result. It's a horrible result, 0-1. That's really an outlier, though, this year. I actually think she's been – I mean, how often have we talked about how good the top three have been for Pepperdine? So I wouldn't make this the rule. I would say, though, she didn't have a great weekend for sure. Yeah, and the question was, what I take away from the weekend? Oh my gosh, she didn't have a good weekend. And I think we haven't seen them compete necessarily against like elite competition outdoors enough. That's fair. I mean, not a weekend. Like, I guess playing Florida, Auburn, like they don't have, you know, again, those are teams known for their depth, not as top heavy as teams like Cal or Stanford, certainly. So Zara was pushing away. The top three, all of them were pushed in ways that we haven't seen them push this year. Again, they took losses in both of their matches. And to see against Stanford in particular, again, for what I think Chen lost in straight sets to Connie Ma at three, which, by the way, the Yepafanova Ma switch justified, Jay. I don't know. Like, Ma's been pretty good at that two spot. Not that yepafanova has been bad at three, but uh, just a shift you certainly note in the Stanford singles lineup. By the way, really good win for freshman Elena Yu, who is a former Billie Jean King girls 18s national champion, someone who was a blue chip prospect coming in, who, again, we talked about how many teams would ha- she'd be playing in the lineup for, uh, but obviously the Stanford team a little bit different. I, the tough thing for me is they're up 3-2 and they have two three set, third sets on the board against Cal. Like That's just a match you got to finish if you want to be inner circle guaranteed. And they didn't finish that one. Like I I don't know. I, I'm not reading too much into the Stanford match because th- those matches were pretty tight everywhere, right? Like Campana was up uh, in her match at four against Huey. Redelick won her first set against Shu. Yeah. Uh, what Czar and Blake were in a third set as well. So, like, that match was much more competitive than the 4-0 scoreline uh, would indicate, although they did lose three straight set matches. For Broadus to be as injured as she was and still go three sets in that Cal match, it just speaks to who she is as a competitor. But, yeah, no, this was, again, I think Pepperdine, by virtue of North Carolina not really having that impressive of a win yet, Virginia taking care of business, but maybe not, any signature wins other than their win over Pepperdine at the national indoors. Like Pepperdine was kind of five ish by default. Right. And I guess more than anything is this result, particularly the Cal one calls that into question. Like it's more clearly there in the five through 14 pack than the top four pack. Yeah. Particularly with the way things are trending with Brodus's injury and they went zero and two at number six, which is a, a spot they need to get better at. So they lost doubles to Stanford, which on this podcast I said would never happen. So I was absolutely wrong. I'm happy if I took any credit for Stanford's win there. But yeah, it was a tough weekend for Pepperdine. And I came away not feeling very confident about their postseason chances. On the Cal side of things, talk about a massive victory for the Bears, another team that just hasn't played that many matches this year. And yet they're up to nine in the rankings, Jay. And again, they get this win down a doubles point and without their number one singles player, Valentina Ivanov. And, like, if Lon Mee is their six, only the elite teams are beating her there. Like, I really like her at that position. And then you just roll out the names. Like, even without Ivanov, Villermoller, Elsola, Weirsholm, 
I think Mushika's looked really good uh, throughout the course of this year as well. Like they can beat you at all six singles positions, and I still feel like they haven't played enough matches to know if they're good at doubles or not. But this team is very frisky in singles. And man, that's I like. You're starting to look at who, if you're a top eight seed, do you really not want to not be a, uh, to come to you if you're not a top eight? If they're not a top eight seed, like Cal's at the top of the list right now. And I know they're nine in the rankings, so great take there. But this team is just untested, or, or this team is just talented enough, and yet still not enough data points to feel certain about the scout that they're maybe the highest variance team I can think of going into May. Yeah, and every single position is yeah. a grind. Yeah, like. You know, every single one of those players is a really tough Tatcha's out for going a, two and a half team. hours. It's just a rule. And she appears to be healthier. Yeah. Uh, there was not a lot of tape on her this weekend. I know she's had shoulder injuries, so that's a huge upside for Cal. This Pac-12 is really dangerous. Yeah. Quick Stanford note, and I know we talked about them a little bit. Obviously, 4-0 win over Pepperdine, three straight set wins, and a doubles point speaks for itself. Are you st- Again, you're around this team more than... I am certainly, and you get to see them in person more than I have. Are you starting, like, do they have that national championship sauce? Obviously they make the lineup switch. I think for Elena, you to come in and play so successfully, it's just a great data point to have of, okay, we can run seven deep. And if someone gets banged up or we don't like a matchup, we can make that move and feel pretty confident. I mean, again, Blake, Ma, Yepafanova, you'd ride with that top three any day of the week. 4-0 over a top eight squad, you have to take note. Well, this is the best doubles they've played in years. That singular <laughs> match. So if they can continue, I mean, they tested Brodus and Chen at number one. They played great elsewhere. If they can carry that through, then they absolutely can win a national championship. Now, it becomes very different when you put this team in a bunch of rowdy Stillwater Oklahoma State fans. Like, I don't really think they've played in front of that before maybe the oklahoma sweet 16 two years ago but that's a factor i can't really consider right now but very talented team and i really liked what i saw in doubles and they do have some depth where if they need to pull blockina struggling with injuries they put in elena Yu at six like that's a great option so they absolutely can the pac-12 tournament might be as fascinating as any tournament we'll have conference championship wise in the country because you can think the two finalists should both be top eight seeds like whomever of stanford cal usc ucla those two finals teams they're top eight quality and that's a significant ranked win available to you in the semifinals. so certainly the Pac-12 in its final year of existence in this iteration has gotten very, very fun for us. Dow this season's home stretch. That's everything that happened in Northern California. Jay, let's go back to the Atlantic Coast now. This isn't an inner circle team. They're not even a top 16 team right now. But you look at Florida State, now up to number 23 in the rankings, Jay. They've won six matches in a row. And I know I've bothered you about them now for like four weeks consecutively on this show. But again, this is one of those teams I'm really fortunate I have the opportunity to watch week in, week out. Because, oh my God, are they, they're good at doubles. They're deep. They're experienced. They have top dogs who can beat you in certain spots. Like Lavakova has been lights out at five. Millie Bissett has played well enough to elevate herself to the number two spot. I think she, or excuse me, to the number four spot. I think she's having a really good year. You know, their top three of Arcadianu, uh, excuse me, Allen, Scope, and Arcadianu, two seniors, and a, I think Scope's a junior or sophomore playing really, really good ball. You know, again, this weekend, 5-2 win over Wake Forest, which would have been a good enough win for them in itself, given it's a top 35 team on the road. But they go to NC State. And they beat the Wolfpack 5-2 in a match where, you know, again, like NC State, it's it's clearly a rule. If they win the doubles point, they're going to lose the match. Like that's what we're starting to learn, Jay, because uh, Florida State on the road against NC State, they're down a doubles point. They won four straight set matches, Jay, uh, one, two, four, and five to win this match. And just like I know NC State's had some serious ups and downs. But to do that on a road, on the road to this NC State team on senior day of all days, and I know Rayetsky was banged up at one, but still, that is a heck of a win 
for this Florida State team, and it just gets you thinking, like, man, I don't want them coming to my region. Yeah, and you start looking at the totality of the resume. They only have one slightly bad loss, which is to Notre Dame, who's ranked 32. All their other losses are with two teams within the top 20. Yeah, And so they are very clearly a peripheral top 20 team, if not even higher. And I was very surprised and also impressed with how they came out in singles after rebounding from losing the doubles point, given those circumstances on the road, senior day, you don't know exactly what sort of performance you're going to get in singles. And they showed up big time across all of those courts. They ultimately get that number three match in a third set tiebreak as well. So they end up sweeping one through five against this NC state team. Very impressive. To your point, they have some veteran leaders on this team who have seen a lot of different uh, elements of college tennis, someone like Vic Allen, who has been struggled with injuries her entire career, but in and out of the lineup, it's good to see her back in the lineup, getting hugely ranked wins for her. Uh, it was a very impressive performance from FSU. Yeah. And to you, something you mentioned earlier about the Miami matchup against uh, they play NC, not NC State. Miami plays someone this weekend. Oh, Virginia. Virginia, yeah. Florida as, State as gets for, Florida State. Yeah, exactly. That's uh, you beat me to it. That's exactly that's their travel partner. That's you know again a Florida State team with the trend lines up. Do I think they're going to beat Virginia? I do not. Do I think that match could easily go four three? That they could take a doubles point? That they have the depth? That they have the experience to match Virginia across the board? Absolutely. I'd lead in Collard over Monfi at six, but Monfi can go down four one, and then all of a sudden it's five four. She's up in the first set. Like I feel like that happens to me every time I'm scoreboard watching, and I'm like, oh, I can write that set off for a little bit. Oh nope, never mind. We got to bring six back in our lives. Again, it's this Florida State team after making the Sweet Sixteen in 2021. It's had a really weird two-year stretch, 22-23, with injuries and just things not breaking right, the roster not looking like it should look. And this year it has broken right. And this is, again, a team that if they made a Sweet 16, if they went on the road and beat an Auburn, let's say in a regional final, sorry to use you, Auburn, or you know, if it's a Florida-Florida State matchup in a regional yeah, final. Say like, Florida. Yeah, come on now. Like All of these are going to be really – like the, the, again, it's a great litmus test against Virginia. I'm excited we're going to see this team in this version. It's this iteration of confidence get to face a top eight squad. Yeah, because they've t- performed well, I would say, against some of these teams. I do think they started really slow. Yeah. To me, they were in that like Georgia Tech yeah. uh, vibe. Yeah, malaise, great word, where things started to click into place. And I don't know if that was health related or just whatever it is, but they seem to be really firing down the home stretch. I hope they continue to stay healthy because they're going to be a like their seating placement in the ACC tournament is going to be like very much something to watch. They're going to be like the four seed, maybe even the three yeah. seed. Again, NC State now I think has four losses. Like Duke has three or maybe even four losses now after the Virginia match. Like, and Florida State might even be three or, you know, again, if they do get the Virginia win, they're going to be right there with Virginia in that number two seed hunt. And there are a lot of ranked wins on the table. So you can't write off Florida State's top 16 case yet, Jay. I know they're 23 right now, but all the trend lines are up six in a row, six. In a row. It's, it's no Denver men, 18 in a row, but six in a row is pretty darn impressive through what is, again, seems like maybe not as top-heavy, but certainly as deep as ever uh, of an ACC conference. They are certainly, again, one of our superstars of the week, Jay. But I also think there are a bunch of results we got to talk about from this week number 13, kind of one-off results that make you scratch your head and think, hmm, where do these teams sit now? Let's start with NC State. Their 4-3 win over Miami on Friday, a match where I believe they dropped the doubles point before finding four singles victories because, again, that's just how it works. For this NC State team here this season, you look for the Wolfpack. They were able to get a straight set wins from Zero Nova, Dipman, and Zimpardo at 3-4-5. and five. Also, uh, were able to get a three-set win from Ryatsky, who from a set down knocks off Alexa Noel in a match that was as fun as you would imagine I mean, what do we do with the Wolfpack right now, Jay? Again, this team, I think, has four conference losses. NC State right now currently sitting at 12 in the rankings. It was a weird week. Again, like, again, they beat Miami. Miami's a really good team. Like, uh, that team's got depth. 
they've got seniors. They've got a Nong, uh, Shinyi Nong, who seems to be playing better and better with every passing week, certainly has made a sophomore surge. They beat them down a doubles point, but up a doubles point, they fall on senior day to Florida State. It's maybe the most fun roller coaster ride we have this year. Well, North Carolina and NC State liked dominating the headlines <laughs> last season, so they decided to do it again just in different avenues. It's a reflex. But- Exactly. The pendulum has swung, but we're still talking about them. This one reads more like a standard NC State win where you get the four victories from Ryeski, Zieranova, Dittman, and Zampardo. Those four have probably been the most solid. They didn't have Abrams in that match against Miami. Uh, Abrams and Rancelli have both been struggling. Rancelli's lost six of her last seven, but it's a good solid win for them. But then, yeah, they turn up uh, against FSU and do what we talked about. So. Speaking of FSU, by the way, in that Wake Forest match, they won doubles. Then they needed three three set wins to beat Wake Forest on the road. It was like a three and a half hour match. It was a really fun one. But yeah, they just like drama. Again, NC State, they're the, they want to be in the headlines. Congratulations. We spent another 10 minutes talking about this team. Because, and they've caused a lot of fights, yeah. honestly. No, I mean, <laughs> look, I'm still a big believer in Zimpardo. Like, Zeranova has definitely. I would say she's met expectations here in her – like, she has stepped up in the way they've asked them to. Renchelli's had a tough year. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. The weirdest part about the Florida State loss is that Abrams won in straight sets at six. And, like, you know, again, she had not been winning much over the last six weeks. They got some lineup choices to make. Like, it's just they have yet to play the match other than UNC at the National Indoors where it seems to click everywhere. And even then – you know, they, I think they dropped the doubles point, if memory serves me correct, in that match. So, oh, NC State, they make you scratch your head and think that's half the fun. Still, I like this Miami team. Like, they push you to three hours because Fenning is going to grind. Noel is not going to miss a ball. Bach Collins is going to make you play three hours. Like, Shinyi Nung is probably the most aggressive in the lineup. Shook next takes some swings, but she'll go three hours. Balzert will go three hours. I just like how that team makes they're, – they're the quintessential Miami, Jay, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And so I don't think they're going to finish top 16, but whoever beats them, it's going to take three hours to do so. Yeah, it depends how far back you want to look if you're saying quintessential Miami. I mean, they're ranked 19. They don't have a signature win. Yeah. Their best win right now is Texas A&M. That happened sort of in the dark days of the Texas A&M <laughs> sure. season. So they just, I mean, I know you're a big fan and they were very close. They had dual match points against North Carolina, but they haven't come up. But, yeah. you know, and they only have, looking at this, they only have nine wins. Yeah. They're uh, what, like nine and six or five or something? Yeah. Yeah. So this is another, this is why the ACC tournament is going to be interesting. Like, can Miami get one of those yeah. big wins? Also, they have a chance this weekend going to Virginia as well. So that could be an opportunity. Speaking of Virginia, that's the next team I want to turn to, Jay. Yes, they lose to UNC, but they got one in one on the Chapel Hill swing. 4-2 win, I believe, at the time of clinch uh, over Duke. But then in the end, Katie Codd does finish her match, gets a three-set win over Natasha Subash. Uh, again, This was an extraordinary match. Virginia takes the doubles, but Duke did not back down. They got four first sets in singles, one, three, four, and six. You know, the big moment for Duke where I thought, oh, my God, they're going to win this match. When Barankova got off in straight sets because she served for it twice, Collard broke her twice, forced a breaker, had a set point, I think multiple set points. Collard ultimately knocked off 10-8 in that breaker by Barankova. When she leveled things at two-all, at that time, Katie Codd was up a set. Uh, Emma Jackson was up a set. And it just felt like, oh, my God, like Duke might have this one at home. But, man, credit to Virginia. Again, Subash just staying alive as long as she did allowed Chervinsky 0-1 over Schwetz. Come on now. That's a ridiculous result. Shake 3-4 and four over Kim Ji. That's a really good win. Uh, another good one for Shake. But then for Annabelle Shu, who was down a break, I think three separate times they were on break in that third set at one, for her to deliver the clinch over Emma Jackson on the road. You know, the sophomore has always been talented. We've always known what she's capable of. That might be the biggest win of her career, Jay, on the road at Duke to clinch the 4-2, given the context of what that, you know, again, that win keeps him in the ACC regular season title hunt. Nice bounce back for the team, given, again, the fashion with which they lost Friday. Yeah, I I think it was. I mean, I think on the Virginia side, 
this was just super close for them. So to pull this out is a nice feather in the cap to give them the confidence that they have historically, at least over the last few months in the ACC, been winning matches comprehensively. But they've been plo- uh, they've been playing kind of like the lower tier of the ACC, but they've been doing as expected. Here, things got really tight on the road, and they were able to pull that out. On the flip side for Duke, it's another heartbreaker. This one's probably even more of a heartbreaker than the match against North Carolina. There was probably like a five-minute stretch where you – maybe five to 10 minute stretch in the North Carolina match where you could see where they could win here. It felt like it was a much longer stretch for that. But I think what's most impressive is they still do not have Ellie Coleman in this lineup. I don't know if she's out for the season, but they stacked up really well against yeah. Virginia three through six, they lose one and two, but where you thought they might be weaker given the absence of Coleman and everyone having to move up. I thought they stacked up really well. Baronkova getting that win at six, um, so you have to find some silver linings there for Duke. For Barankova to win that match, it made it one Duke had to take because, again, that has been one of the positions you've been able to attack the Blue Devils at this season. But this Duke team's good. Like, they are good, and they can beat you at all six spots. That's a really nice win for Katie Cod. I love the way she goes after the forehand. Again, the backhand line, the size she brings as well. Kim, he's a really well-rounded player. Again, Shea had to bring her best to close that match out in straights. We've talked about the resurgent Bryce Galova. Like, that is the worst loss, by the way, Schwetz has taken all season. Like, I'd still give her the benefit of the doubt. Duke's in the mix. Like, again, if they can get a big win, it'll be fascinating to see. If UNC is the number one seed, you know, again, if, what, Virginia's your two, who's your three, who are your six and seven, right? If your six and seven are Miami and Georgia Tech, like, that's a really fun side of the draw. Uh, again, this ACC still has the depth that we, it's very much, again, of this last three-year run that they have been on. Um, Duke's good, but that's a credit to this Virginia team that they're able to knock them out uh, and get the 4-2 victory at the time of clinch. Another good 4 3 or Jay. Auburn, 4-3 over Alabama. Obviously, the Alabama early season run, the balloon's been deflated ever so slightly, but on the glass half full note, it's a really good win for Auburn on the road in Tuscaloosa as they try to consolidate their top 16 spot for them to take the doubles point in this match to uh, get the clinch at the number, what, uh, I want to say three spots, six, four in the third from the senior Arsenault in this last rivalry matchup. They're good. Again, they won doubles in the top three in this match. That's an impressive win. Well, that's been their pathway so yeah. far is they either need to win doubles and then find one one through four because they haven't been winning many matches at <laughs> five and six. Particularly in this match, they didn't even have Selene Ovunk in the lineup there. So they get swept there at five and six. And as I thought it was a good bounce back for Ariana Arsenault, who is now at three. She lost that heartbreaker to Tennessee the weekend before in that 4-3. So for her to pull this out, 6-4 in the third, really good victory. But this is one of those weird matches where kind of the bookends of the the match were over pretty quickly. You had straight set wins Mm -hmm. at one and two, five and six, and then you had three and four grinding it out. Ultimately, Arsenault got the clinch there at three. So yeah, we'll see. It's funny. I'm looking at my notes here. and We've been talking about how crazy the ACC tournament is going to be. And in my notes, I say, we're going to see total chaos in the SEC. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think and the Pac-12. The Semifinals I on. I think that's organized chaos. Though. Yeah, well said. Right? You know what? Yeah. That's why I keep you around. That's exactly <laughs> right. That will be organized chaos. The ACC and SEC just start throwing darts. Like I have, you know, again, South Carolina is playing you 4-3. Uh, Tennessee's playing you 4-3. Um, I still don't know how good this Texas A&M team is. I really don't, but they could be excellent. Same thing, I'm really not sure. We still haven't had the Georgia all seven points peak at the same time match either. Yeah, there's going to be some chaos. And through it all, like, you think you're beating Auburn? Anything better than 4-2? Have you watched this team for 40 years now consecutively in their final run in a conference tournament? Yeah, this is a really good win for them. Look, Alabama's going to make the tournament. I think Alabama's still on the whole new head coach. This is a very good first year. Uh, But definitely the balloon's been a little bit deflated after they got off to this roaring start through the first six weeks of the season. The last one in the make-you-think category, Jay. Arizona State, 4-0 win over Washington. Dare I say maybe our biggest upset, quotation marks around that, of the weekend. This match was at Arizona State. But 
that's a tough loss for a Washington team that seemed to have been trending upward. Not only do they lose the match, Jay, but three straight set victor uh, straight set losses, one, four, and five. It's tough. I mean, yeah. they've been playing up in the Pacific Northwest, and they got to go down to Arizona. We saw Ohio State get tripped up when they went to Arizona State. They lost there. Uh, it's a tough. It's a tough road trip. We see this on the men's side as well. These are tough places to play, and um, you would like to see it a little bit closer. But you know, it's good reps for them as they continue to play outdoors over the next few weeks. I thought they could be top sixteen frisky just if going into the Pac twelve tournament. You know, again, all things were trending up, and they'd get a shot at a USC, UCLA, Cal, Stanford, maybe even two, three shots at those teams. And then, hey, you pull off the magic, you get two wins, and you find yourself in a final again. You absolutely can find yourself as a top 16 seed. Probably no longer the case after this yeah. Arizona State oh. loss. I'm officially ready to cross off Washington for my top 16 contenders list. Still, I like, the, you know, again, they've got some experience at Olsen, Saker, Maud Fortin, et cetera, et cetera. We've gone through this before. We don't have to do it again. But, yeah, that one certainly hurts uh, for Washington uh, for a win again for Arizona State. Impressive stuff and probably ensures they will be in the NCAA tournament. Not that you or I had any doubt about that. But, Jay, last but not least, let's get to some weekends I think everyone should know about. Again, these aren't teams in the inner circle in the top 16 hunt, but teams that with the weekends they had either are feeling really good or perhaps now a little bit nervous about their NCAA tournament chances. Wisconsin has an asterisk next to it, and Jay and I owe you a little bit more reporting, but Wisconsin did get a 4-2 win over Illinois. It said that Wisconsin got a 4-3 victory over Northwestern entering today. However, some sources are telling us there has been a protest and that Northwestern has won that protest of the Wisconsin singles lineup. As a result of that protest, it is Northwestern who will be awarded the victory in that dual match. Not only does it hand Wisconsin their first Big Ten loss of the regular season, that win will do a number in propelling Northwestern into the NCAA tournament conversation. I believe this week's rankings have that win on their resume, and as such, it has them at number 37 right now in the ITA rankings. Jay, again, that's a program that historically had been a top 16 lock throughout the 2000s, early 2010s, obviously has fallen off here in the 2020s. So, man, that's significant. Again, we owe a little bit more reporting, but... Jay, your reaction? Well, to to this uh, lineup protest, I mean, well, more just in is... general. The I guess, yeah, you know what? I apologize for interrupting. However, you want to react. I'm. I did plenty of due diligence for this episode, as I always do. I'm mad. I'm like now looking back at. It, I'm like, what did I miss? Like, I now need to go back and look at what would have been the protested. Lineup. Yeah, like what was out of uh, out of pocket, but. That is huge because we were about to get ready to talk about how Wisconsin and Michigan are playing this weekend, and they're both undefeated in conference, and winner would win the Big Ten outright. And now that's not going to be the case and completely changes the complexion of this Wisconsin season in a lot of ways and, to your point, now helps Northwestern significantly. Um. match protest confirmed yeah it has to be at one it can't be at four right i mean look they lost two spots one and four straight set wins for wisconsin at two three five and six which after the job dropping the doubles point is how they were listed as the four three winners i mean shisharina three and over mukertova Shinisa, I'm gonna have to do some examining of their stats, it has Jay, to be it has to be one because yeah. shokalova 14 and 3 at 1 and they ended up playing Merkatova at 1 and she is 0 and 1 at 1 6 and 3 at 2. That's some investigative reporting on this on the fly for all of you. Yeah, I would agree that's where it is as well. We'll try and get some comments. Uh some commentary on what exactly unfolded. But again, that's massive for Northwestern. Gets them back in the NCAA tournament hunt. You're right, puts a damper on the Wisconsin-Michigan matchup that was going to be really fun this weekend. Still will be really fun, by the way, because if Wisconsin wins it, now there are three teams, Ohio State, Michigan, Wisconsin, all with one loss in Big Ten play. Um, but, yeah, again, it's a weekend you got to know about from the Wisconsin Badgers, who now are, what, like 17-3 and 3 
overall on the season or something funky like that. A uh, fascinating season up in Madison. How about Notre Dame, Jay? I like this team. I really do. And again, they're one I see every week. By the way, that's probably my catchphrase now of the modern day shows. I like this team. I really do. But this team has some experience, right? Beckman, Freeman, Gauche. Um, I'm, I'm blanking. Uh, Julianne Dreach, I think, is still on this. Uh, if I'm, if my memory is serving me, me correct, again, a lot of names th- flow through my head every week. But 6-1 over Boston College, 4-3 win over Syracuse. By the way, after that NC State win, Syracuse has fallen precipitously. They're at to, down to 56 right now in the country. Notre Dame, as of right now, currently sitting all the way up at number 32 in the ITA computer rankings, Jay. Again, what this 2-0 weekend did is just, like, they're in the NCAA tournament, and that matters. Yeah, well, if I thought you were a big Florida State fan, Notre Dame is a huge Florida State fan because it's far and away their best win. So they're rooting for the Seminoles to keep it up, get that upset win over Virginia, because after that, they have a win over Columbia, and then it starts to fall off. So, um, I mean, this is doing business in the ACC. Like, you need to beat – these teams that they beat this weekend in Boston College and Syracuse. Yeah, Boston College is pretty solid as well. So is Syracuse, again, and so two really good wins for them defending their home turf, and yeah, rooting for the Seminoles as hard as anyone. How about TCU? They're still on the outside looking in, but they keep their tournament chances at least alive, I would say, uh, given the weekend they just put together 4-0 win over Baylor, 4-1 win over SMU. In fact, TCU up to number 40. In the NCAA, uh, in the, excuse me, the ITA rankings right now, Jay, as a result of those wins. So they were outside the top 50. They're now one of the last teams pre cut line of this NCAA tournament. Talk about a significant, especially, this needs to be mentioned, they lost two heartbreakers 4 3 last weekend. To bounce back 4 0, 4 1, get yourself back into the tournament mix, tip of the cap to TCU. Yeah, this was a massive weekend. I mean, this to me is like highlighting of weekends to know about. I mean, TCU put themselves into tournament hunt with this weekend. These are the two biggest wins of the season for them in Baylor and SMU. Massive weekend for them. And you started to see some of that veteran experience. I think it was Martins who clinched one of these matches. I know we weren't like in 4-3 territory, but uh, really impressive performance for TCU to bounce back, as yeah. you said, after that weekend last week. And we're always hard, and I'm going to include myself in that conversation on programs where there's a gap between how the men and the women perform. And obviously TCU is one of those notable programs we've talked about. That's why you you got to note the successes. If we're going to be hard on you, we're going to tip the cap as well. Really well job well done by TCU to get themselves back in the mix. You know who this year's Charlotte is, Jay? It's FIU, who gets a 4-0 win over Rice, 4-3 win over South Florida, Have I spent the most time watching the FIU film? I'd be lying if I said I had. But, again, this team right now in the ITA rankings sitting inside the top 30, Jay. They're 28 in the ITA rankings. It's a hell of a year for the FIU women. Yeah, I mean, this is their 13th straight win. And (laughs) they will certainly win their conference tournament in Conference USA. So they're going to be in the tournament. I feel like they were in that same tier with Charlotte last year as well. They brought in some really solid freshmen last year. They lost one of them to the portal, and they've continued to deliver this season. So now they're looking to see if they can just hold on to this top 32 ranking, end up being a two seed there, get a win in that first round. 15-2 and overall. Their two losses, Jay, are to Miami and Florida. Not bad, huh? It's not bad at all. (laughs) Uh, Again, both of those were road losses, by the way, as well. In Gainesville, at Miami, obviously, they're a Florida-based team as well. But, like, this team's got some good wins. They beat a Wake team that I know is very good. They beat UCF. They beat SMU. They beat Yale. You have our attention. Uh, is all I'm saying, FIU, heading into the offseason. We won't be shocked to see you in round number two of the tournament. Well, and that's basically what we'll look for. It's yeah. not going to be a competitive conference tournament, so we're the data points are going to be limited when they show up. And unfortunately for them, likely a Florida-based region, uh, assuming a team like a Florida is a top 16 seed, so they might get that rematch again. Yeah, they lost 4-2. To Florida in Gainesville. That was a really fun kickoff weekend match for those of you like us who oh, yeah. unfortunately can't forget it. Um, and so shout out to FIU. We do have to do one glass half empty. It felt like Vanderbilt was starting to gain a little steam. Ugh, a couple of heartbreakers for the doors this weekend. 4-3 losses to Florida, South Carolina, Jay. Again, they're getting into the tournament, but after these losses, Vanderbilt back down to 30. I mean, on a side note, huge wins 
for South Carolina and Florida. The Gators at 13 right now. South Carolina knocking on the door at 18. And to Jay's point, SEC teams right now, A&M's 11, Tennessee 17, South Carolina 18, um, and there was one. Oh, and Auburn 14. Four top 20 teams who all need good SEC tournaments to ensure their top 16. Yeah, chaos is on the horizon. But, Jay, that's a tough one for Vandy. Yeah, tough to be on the losing end of both of these. I would say there is a silver lining, though, and that was that they were without Bridget Stammel, who has been playing as high as two for them this season. So assuming she does come back, you feel like if you're Vanderbilt, a Florida, a South Carolina are matches you could win in the SEC tournament. And they also still have two four-pointers on their ranking for eight and nine. So there's a lot of room to be gained for them, assuming they – they have one final weekend. They have Georgia and Tennessee. Georgia's probably a long putt for them, but Tennessee could be winnable. So if they get that and then they get a win in the SEC tournament, you know, they're not going to be top 16, but they're going to be, you know, within the top 25. And Vanderbilt, by the way, I wouldn't put her in the gal conversation because the team's not good enough, but CB Moore has been exceptional this year and she's up to number eight in the country i appreciate johan pointing it out in the chat yeah she, her weapons are just real like that again to have that at the top of your lineup is a good starting point for any team and cb moore has played the role so well uh here this season so do want to give her a shout out like that was a sneaky i was looking at the individual rankings and the two that stood out to me rachel galis at 11 i was like huh i was like that feels a little high um and cb moore at eight like she kind of has been that good this year for Vanderbilt, Jay. So there's your fun note on some of the weekends you should know about team-wise. We do have, again, a bunch of other results we, of course, could have hit here on today's show. Jay, I don't know if I, I – you know, again, Oklahoma 4-3 over Texas Tech. They need to win that match. They did. Undefeated weekends for Georgia, Tennessee, USC, UCLA as they all stay in the hunt. Big weekend for Rice. 4-2 win over FAU, 4-0 win over USF, Princeton, 4-3 over Columbia, needed that one uh, to get things going in Ivy League play. But, you know, I, I feel like we hit everything. Did I miss any big ones? Any other thoughts from you on Week 13? I'll just go through my thoughts. The Oklahoma State, 4-3 over UCF. Yes, it was clinched at 4-0, but it caught my eye. And I think okay. there are a few, like, chinks in the armor there for Oklahoma State. They're certainly not running through that Big 12 like you might expect. Uh, you already mentioned Oklahoma over Texas Tech. For Texas, they did beat Texas Tech 4-0, but still no Zainalova for them. I think that's a huge absence. They cannot afford to not be having her. Uh, USC went on the road and had a very close match against Utah, uh, ultimately eked out the win there. And then something that has caught my eye with uh, our Michigan Wolverines hmm. is Julia at two, Gala at three. What they do with those two, they've flipped Gala at two, Julia at three. I'm very curious to see what they end up doing for the NCAA tournament because you know, Julia lost a match at, I think, three uh, against, was it Michigan State? So that one I'm I'm watching for. All right, something to keep a note. And again, Michigan's going to travel to Madison this weekend to play Wisconsin. We'll talk about that as we look at the week ahead. But with a recap of Week 13's results in the books, we got one other final thing to do, Jay, before we uh, turn the page on this week of the season. And that, of course, is to offer our rankings coming out of Week 13. All these results in the book, how do they impact how we see things? It's worth noting, again, right now, how do our rankings compare to the ITA team computer rankings? Right now, we only disagree on one top 10 team. We have Texas A&M at the number 10 spot. The ITA computer rankings have USC at the number 10 spot, but let the record show the ITA computer rankings have USC uh, excuse me have Texas A&M at number 11 we have USC tied for number 11 in our rankings as well so not too far off from there we actually agree exactly with the ITA rankings in our top four Oklahoma State remains at number one undefeated overall on the season Michigan still at that number two spot Stanford back up to number three and UNC Back into the top four following their victory over Virginia. After that, again, same group of four teams. We go Texas 5, Virginia 6, Pepperdine 7, Georgia 8. The computer rankings go Virginia 5, Georgia 6, Pepperdine 7, Texas. I think underranked there at that number 8 spot. We all agree 
Cal's the number nine team in the country right now. It certainly feels that way following their win over Pepperdine. John J. Parsons, your reaction to this week's team rankings? Yeah, I think these look great. I mean, I think these are the top four and the top five through eight. So I think those teams are in the right spots. Maybe the order is different. We have some injury concerns that we just mentioned with Zainalova of Texas. Like they're not a top, top five team if they don't have Zainalova. Uh, Georgia, we didn't see Vekic a few times, mm-hmm. but by and large, I think these are the right uh, right teams. It's a crime to have AM above UCLA because it's not actually a crime. It's one spot. That's done just again. Some hyperbole here late. UCLA beat Stanford. Like, they have to be. number. I mean, again, they were my number 10 team. I had, uh, excuse me, they were my number 9 team. I had them at 9, Cal at 10, A&M at 11. Jay, do you mind if I reveal what you had? You had the same, you had A&M on the outside looking in, much like I did. You had Cal at 8, Pepperdine 9, UCLA at 10. Okay, we both agree there. But again, both we have still outside of the top 8 looking in. Let's do this quickly because we have only one week of regular season play left. Who do you think are top eight locks right now? Regardless of what happens in conference play, they're top eight. So Oklahoma State's a lock, right? They're one, yes. Michigan's two wins over NC State, less valuable by the day, but I would put them as another yes at two, just again, the national indoor run, et cetera. I mean, Texas is eight in the computer rankings. I think they should be a lock. Stanford has to be a lock, so that's three. Is UNC a lock, or do we just have three right now? I mean, I think when you look at these rankings, it's very clear Oklahoma State, Michigan are locks. Stanford all the way through. Stanford would have to lose in the semifinals to, like, Cal specifically and have UCLA beat Cal in the tournament final to, like, lose their top eight. It's like a very specific, it feels like, (laughs) scenario has to play out for Stanford to not beat top eight. But I actually think that's where the locks stop. Yeah, but I mean, they're all grouped up up until like there's some separation between in the ITA rankings between Pepperdine and Texas from a points perspective. Yeah. Um, but right now, everyone outside of the top eight right now in the ITA rankings has work to do. UNC is close. Like again, Georgia, Virginia, Duke, Miami, Florida State, all really good wins. They're definitely right on the knocking on the doors of locking their top eight status. But yeah, I mean, again, and then after that, the race for from 12 to 22 is really, really fascinating as well. We can revisit that after we conclude a bunch of regular season play next week. Yeah, that's what the top 10 of our team rankings look like. The ITA team rankings look like for what it's worth. Top five of the singles rankings. Stoyana one, Brantmeyer two, Miller three, Obi Kajuru four, Rayetsky five. Doubles teams, Scotty and Brantmeyer one, Chet and Broadus two, Shusherbina, Guzman three, Stoyana Kupras four, Kajuru and Komar five. It's a fun snapshot of where things stand yeah. here on April 9th. If you ever want proof that the fall really matters for your <laughs> rankings, but this is like the last year for it because yeah. like we're moving it's to funny. a fall NCAAs, but like look where Reese Brantmeyer is ranked in singles and doubles. Look where Guzman and Sherby Nina are all American champions in doubles. It, you know, fall really matters. Absolutely. Well, with that said, folks, that is, is where things stand after week 13 of this 2024 season. As we look towards week 14, the final week of regular season play in both the ACC, SEC, Pac-12, Big 12, J. There are a lot of different matches I could have highlighted. I have a couple of individual battles and then a couple of road trips to keep in mind. Let's start, excuse me, with the individual battles. Pepperdine's right back at it as they will host, excuse me, the UCLA Bruins uh, in Malibu, Again, I said the team rankings. UCLA right now sitting at 15, Pepperdine's at 7. I love this matchup. UCLA obviously got the win over Stanford, so they're feeling confident. They played Cal extraordinarily close then as uh, that same weekend as well. The top three matchups, Tien, Hans versus whether it's it probably Zar and Chen, given the injuries to Brodus, the matchups down below, the doubles matchups. It's going to be spicy, Jay. Who you got and why? Oof. Yeah, I mean, this is a feels like a must win for Pepperdine to just stop some of the bleeding, but I don't know. I'm going to go Pepperdine. I feel like the UCLA magic has typically happened at home, although they did get the win against Stanford on the road, but 
Uh, I don't know. I, I can't pick Pepperdine. I have to go UCLA. Fair enough. Again, another – yeah, it, it, it's absolutely – Pepperdine probably locks up their top eight berth with a win over UCLA here uh, on uh, this weekend. UCLA right back in the mix with a win over Pepperdine as well. And then again, the organized chaos of the Pac-12 tournament becomes that much more enticing – is is South Carolina at Florida a top 16 elimination match? It's not, right? Because they have the SEC tournament. But again, Florida's 13 right now in the rankings. South Carolina number 18. It is a huge matchup. You know, again, talk about the unstoppable force versus the immovable object. Ackley, Hamner at the top for South Carolina. All the depth that Florida presents. Jay, what you got in that SEC battle? Well, it does kind of feel like a must win for South Carolina. Yeah. Florida's actually, to use your word, quite well ensconced in mm-hmm. next week's live rankings. So they're all the way up to number 11. So I feel like they're not at risk here, but South Carolina, it's just another missed opportunity, right? It's not really going to hurt them so much, but you, at some point, how do you jump a Tennessee, Auburn, UCLA? You need to get wins. Yeah, it's a huge matchup. You got Florida since they're at home? I'm going to go Florida. All right, fair enough. Let's get to the road trips now. We've talked about it earlier. Miami, Florida State at Virginia. Again, Virginia cruised through the portion of the ACC calendar that they should. But coming off of the Tobacco Road weekend, now they're at home. They're facing probably the next two best teams in the conference in Miami and Florida State. Given the ups and downs of NC State, I say that NC State's right there with that group. I apologize, but you get what I'm saying. Do either knock off the who's at home. I'm going to say no, but I actually think it's very possible that UVA goes one and one. It's just the depth. Gonna... Like both teams can match up six deep with Virginia. And then I don't see a comp- – like you probably lean Noel and Allen over either shoe. Um, maybe not Heba Shake given how well she's been playing, but if they play shoe at one, you might lean that way. I think Fenning versus Shake is a really good match. You'd probably lean Fenning – over um or not fending excuse me you'd probably lean shake over scope but then arcadiano's sitting right there at three like by the way both teams have been pretty solid on doubles point i don't think bach collins and noel have lost more than two times this year at the number three spot for miami again it's not as big of a sample size as others we're gonna get some four two four threes like i'm really excited to have these matchups on our broadcast i will be locked in Absolutely, both these teams are playing well enough. Again, Florida State's won six in a row. They can go beat Virginia. Miami's knocked on the door of beating just about every big team they face this year as well. So really looking forward to that one. What about Auburn, Alabama at A&M? The reason I have that Tier 1, J is, again, A&M was a preseason top five team, and I still feel like I don't know how good they are. They've just quietly been kind of humming along through the SEC regular season, their only loss at Georgia what do you make of this weekend? Does Auburn steal one at a and Does Alabama give us a February-type performance, or do the Aggies flex their muscles here? Yeah, I mean, I think Texas A&M gets through Alabama comfortably. I think the one to watch here is Auburn. The problem is I think Auburn matches up terribly with Texas A&M <laughs> because if you're going to beat Texas A&M, you want to sweep five and six. And if there's any team that's not going to sweep five and six right now, it's Auburn. And, you know, pound for pound at the top there like texas a&m is really strong however i don't think they'll have nicole kieran in this match she is currently playing the billy jean king cup mm-hmm. for israel so like that makes things very spicy mm-hmm. but texas a is a tough place to play i'll go the Aggies. Yeah, again those are the four tier one weekends i have uh coming up in week 14 but a lot of other good ones the other half nc state wake and a travel to georgia tech unc duke at notre dame can notre dame steal one of those wins kind of capitalize again upperclassmen across the roster senior day coming up that will be fun to monitor michigan at wisconsin vanderbilt at georgia tennessee you know, again, even FAU at FIU. That's one I'll keep my eye on over the course of the weekend as well. Jay, any other Week 14 matchups you want to comment on here? No, you've certainly listed a good amount a of A smorgasbord, dare I say, for us to end. Well, folks, that's your look at Week 14. Before we go, though, I'm trying to reinstitute something fun as a final segment at the end of every Deciding Point show that we do. And, you know, given 
We talk so frequently about the college tennis world as a pathway to the professional circuit. It does feel worth noting here on today's show that two-time NCAA singles champion Danielle Collins has now won 13 consecutive matches on the WTA Tour. First player since Serena to win Miami. Charleston back-to-back. She's fourth in the WTA points race right now, Jay. And look, she announced this is going to be her final season, but it was a decade ago that she won her first of two NCAA singles titles after transferring from the University of Florida to the University of Virginia. You know, it just got me thinking, like, how have NCAA singles champions done in recent memory on the NC, uh, out on the Pro Tour? And, you know, what, do we, what should we be looking for? What should we remember about each of these players or their characteristics or things that stand out? Again, it just got me thinking because it's been 10 years for Danielle Collins. And you look at some of the champions since her run to that first title, it's been a pretty good 10-year stretch of NCAA singles champions translating somewhat successfully out onto the pro tour, Jay. Like just, I guess all I'm trying to do is build enough bullet points to say the best player in college tennis is a top 100 professional player. And looking at the past decade, I feel like I'm going to be able to make that argument before I do what appealed to you most about this exercise. Oh my gosh. I mean, I spent, this was a trip down memory lane. (laughs) I had so much fun with this. This could be a full 30 minute segment. Uh, (laughs) I mean, I'll just make call call one thing out. So Brianne Miner, who won for Michigan in 2017, is not going to be someone you'll list as like having top 100 success. However, that 2017 draw was stacked, particularly stacked with players that have gone on to have incredible double success. Now, Brianne Miner unseated in that draw, certainly one of like the sneak winners we've had. My senior year. And that, oh, there you go. Well, just prior, you guys had won the... Uh, club tennis championship yeah. prior no, to no, brian that Miner's year we won first like let the record oh, yeah, that's, yeah. What, that's what i'm yeah, saying my, prior to her winning and, you guys won and let the record show sorry because you brought it up tomorrow's the seven year anniversary april 10th 2017 carry on highlights on youtube <laughs> so i i was going back because i remember you know who were the top seeds francesca di lorenzo Haley carter who did they lose to di lorenzo lost to meyer sharif who is a top wow. seven WTA player and Haley Carter lost in the first round to Anna Danalina who, of Florida, wow. who just won the U.S. Open Mixed Doubles champion. So, so many fun names. To add to uh, some other names in that draw, you had Ellen Perez, who's been a top 10 doubles player. Ina Shibahara from UCLA, who's been a top 10 doubles player. Aaron Rutliff from Alabama, two-time NCAA champion, who won the U.S. Open. Luisa Stefani, who's been a top 10 doubles players like so many incredible names that was one of the things that stuck out to me when i was going back and doing my research i could talk about this for two more then i'm gonna see the floor to you give me some other data just empty the clip here as we look at the last 10 years of ncaa singles champions i'm gonna list them for everyone here quickly and then i just want you to empty the clip years that stood out to you things you research i'm just curious what your approach to this topic was because again the theme i'm trying to point out is best player in college tennis you should translate to pro success Since 2014, champions were as follows. Danielle Collins, Jamie Loeb of North Carolina, Danielle Collins again in 2016, Brianne Miner of Michigan in 2017, Ariane Hartono, who we talked about in a bunch of summer and fall deciding points, Jay, the old Miss grad in 2018, Stella Perez Somariba, 2019 champion. She also made the final in 2021 where she was knocked out by a freshman by the name of Emma Navarro, who you might have heard of if you're a pro tennis fan. Peyton Stearns of Texas wins it in 2022 in a field that included Emma Navarro, who got knocked out, of course, by Abigail Renshelly in the quarters. And then last year, Fongran Tien knocking out Lane Sleeth of Oklahoma in that final, um, again, I don't want to say unexpected champion because she was really good throughout the course of the year, but wasn't the champion you would have put in your inner circle to start the tournament. And it did feel like last year's event was the setup for what should be a very heavily weighted event this year, right? Like that year was the first year of a two-year run for this group of players at the top of women's college tennis. Anyways, again, top 100 players in this list. Collins, Navarro, Stearns, so three out of the uh, th- four out of the last ten winners, and three of them since there's only three names, top 100 players. Hartona was what top 150? I want to say she's like at a career high right now of 135. I love that. What's Jamie Loeb's career high? It's got to be in the top 200. 
132. Yeah, another top 150 player. Uh, Preso Mariba asterisk because she got injured, so wasn't really able to play a full pro tour, uh, pro, pro career, excuse me, the way she would have hoped. Same thing really with Brienne Minor. Injuries kind of wiped away her career right off the bat after that NCAA title. And Fong Grantian still in school. So, like, injuries aside, the worst case scenario is Hartono or Loeb. Like, that's a, that is a healthy 10 year run for women's college tennis. Yeah, well, I think that's a heavy caveat when you're yeah. just saying, like, okay, no Brienne Minor, no Perez Somariba. Um, but yeah, other than okay, that, but everyone has that's been. That's two. That's two of the nine. Like, again, and you right. can't include Tien because she's still in school, but she won a couple of futures this past summer yeah. as well. So, like, signs are pointing up. I'm saying if seven of the nine end up top 150 players, that's how I want to frame it. Like, that's yes. a pretty good starting point. Yeah, absolutely. And we're starting to see it's this is an easy thing to do because they all won the NCAA singles champion, but there's sure. so many other players littered throughout these draws that didn't actually win. Empty but have the gone clip, on Jay. To be, do it. Empty like, the clip <laughs> on me. Well, the 2017 was the big one, but just like history lesson, what's so interesting about Danielle Collins is two runs is particularly in 2014, like not really an odds on favorite. Second best player title. on her team. El Baba was better exactly. that year. And a lot of that is, we could debate this, but <laughs> a lot of that is because they played a lot indoors. Yeah. Danielle Collins, not a strong indoor player, surprisingly, just given how big her strokes are. Sure. Um, but for her to get the two championships, like always you're seeing these hot streaks now, hit these hot streaks, NCAA. Jamie Loeb, Haley Carter, two players in that same conference, same era that were more consistent in their delivery. Or Robin Anderson, like another name you'd throw Robin out there Anderson. from UCLA who had the gal flirtations certainly towards the end of her career. Amina Baptist yep. comes from this era and she recently made a top 100 debut. She was 2014, yep. 15, 16-ish range. Like, there's, I, I mean, I haven't mentioned a single Stanford name, but I'm sure there are a bunch from this era, Jay. Well, are uh, there? Because we kind of ended with the Gibbs Burdett era, and sure. then the, the the team titles here were really delivered by a Caroline Lampel, sure. a, a Melissa Lord, right, um, a Caroline Doyle who didn't end up doing playing pro, pro tennis. So not actually as many Stanford players here, um, which makes it maybe that much more impressive because the program that had been the flagship in women's college tennis goes away, and now there's this talent boom. It's because the other schools started getting better, like at recruiting, bringing in more talent. Yeah. Yeah, well, you look back to that 2018. So 2018, where Hartona won, she was quietly excellent. She was never a the gal, can, never the gal, but she was 22 and two at at one for Ole Miss that season. She beats Ashley Lehu, who kind of was the gal. Um, that Pepperdine team in 2018 got gets upset by Georgia Tech in a match. I know you won't forget <laughs> that top three has Ashley Lehu, Meyer Sharif, and Luisa Stefani, oh, yes. right? All who have gone on to do really first uh, incredible things. Yeah, there you go. Sure. So 2019, um, Stella Perez Somariba is someone that probably doesn't get talked about as much, but mm -hmm. certainly a an all-time great in college tennis. She reached the Sweet 16 all four years. She reached the Elite Eight three times, and she made back-to-back -back NCAA finals. She was the only person to defeat Peyton Stearns in the NCAA individual tournament because Peyton played tw <laughs> only played twice. Shout out to Abigail uh, Shelley on the other end of that stat with Navarro. Well, and so what's interesting about the 2021 and 2022 runs from Navarro, her freshman year, and then Stearns, uh, her sophomore year, is they both got, they were revenge tours yeah. in a lot of ways because Emma had only lost to Perez Somariba in the regular season. She beats her in the NCAA uh, wow. final there. Peyton Stearns had lost to two players, Connie Ma and Emma, Emma Navarro. Yeah. Not able to get the revenge Beats over Emma, Connie but does the get the final. revenge. I remember the these storylines now, yeah. Yeah. So th those two runs actually parallel each other in a lot of ways. And certainly in hindsight, Fung Grantian was out there playing in LA and we just didn't see enough of her. And she comes in, she doesn't drop a set in that, in that uh, path to victory. Her win in all likelihood will age pretty well. Yeah. So uh, really fun to go back and look at the history of a lot of these wins. And we've had so many decorated storylines and, it's always interesting to look back. It is fascinating that the people who won the doubles title aren't always the people who go on to have the doubles success from the draw because you look at the chance. Like, Rutliff and Jansen, your last back-to-back -back champions, obviously we know what Aaron Rutliff has gone on to do. But, like, you know, again, 
Di Lorenzo and Kawhi say, I like they haven't done anything. Brooke Austin, Courtney Keegan. I would have thought Brooke Austin was going to go on to do all of these things, but again, didn't really happen in the pros. McKenna's on her way. Like it certainly has started to build. She and Jamie Loeb yeah. actually had a lot of success. Absolutely, in and I mean, again, we'll see all things Scotty. Um, Jada Daniel, Nell Miller, still too early to make a ruling. Andrews and Broomfield, no. Gullivan and Richardson, no. But again, like you look at the doubles boom that we've seen on, on the pro tour, like that. That's just a funny note to me. I mean, part of it is the quality of partner, teammate, etc. Finding the right person, maybe even a better person once you're out on the pro tour. But again, like Aaron Rutliff, in my mind, should have nine slam titles because like her and my, and it should have been with Maya. Like that team was so good in 14 and 15 and again that they won back to back I'm pretty sure they're the only team to do that this century I know Haley uh excuse me Hillary Bart won back to back but she did it with different partners Jay yeah different Burdettes yeah (laughs) I think uh Amanda Augustus might have won yeah but she was 98 99 so again this century I believe was oh I didn't I didn't hear I did not hear yeah yeah, Um, excuse me this century well I also think and I've talked about this like the fact that these coaches are trying to distribute their wealth in doubles means that oftentimes it's not the best pairing from a school that's sure. playing this event. Um, so you might have someone like Luisa Stefani or Ellen Perez who are fantastic doubles players, but maybe you're not putting them with the second best uh, person on the Georgia or Pepperdine team respectively, but yeah, ton of doubles talent. I mean, we have, we could just go on and on about the doubles talent here. Desiree Krychek, another one who would be littered throughout these singles sure. draws. So um, pathway to doubles, absolutely. I could do a full thirty if you want. Like now, I'm just looking at Steph, uh, Stephanie Nikitas and Don Booth of Florida. They won back to back, ninety six, ninety seven. Amy Jensen won three in a row for Cal, uh, ninety eight, ninety nine with Amanda Augustus, two thousand with Claire Curran. Career high one ninety nine in the Pro Tour in doubles. Something, something's not right. Amy, shame. come on, Amy. You won three in a row. Like, again, we, we're going to have to revisit this uh, at a different time. Again, I want to give some history lessons, Jay. This is the fun for me, looking back at yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I think there's definitely off-season episodes here. We do a deep dive on, like, Danielle Collins' 2014 run, celebrating Danielle's retirement. Uh, I mean, beating – but that was the year she beat – no, 2016 was she beat Lin Chi in the yeah, final. That Again, yeah. my – I got to brush up on some history, to say the oh. least. Uh, my, I, okay. I was going through on the men's side as well today. I was like, can I name everyone who played in the finals? And I was like, okay, I think I can. I was like, all right, let's go back in time. Last year it was Quinn versus the GOAT. The year before that, Shelton Holmgren, Riffis versus Rodriguez, Jubb and uh, Borges, Chrysokos Gojo, Kwiatkowski mm-hmm. Blumberg. I don't think I could go as long on the on the women's side right now. So I got to brush up on my history oh. is what I'm saying. Right. I know. I okay. got I to gotta step up my game. We can do that next time. Who can go longer back in time and go six? Well, we just, I just, we just looked at all of these. Yeah, well, again, we'll test the memory then, Jay. I think my, <laughs> okay. my fresh uh, lobes will knock you up. My Jamie lobes will do the job done. Anyways. You mean you're still developing lobes? <laughs> No, they're done developing. I hate to say it. I think it's over. Anyways, all that said, uh, that's your fun topic here to wrap our show. Again, what's been a very fun week number 13 of the 2024 college tennis season, of course, with week 14 on the horizon. It's my last play. It's our final weekend of coverage. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we will be on ESPN Plus every day for the Big 12. Friday, Sunday for the ACC, SEC. Of course, we will also have Big 10 coverage for all of you on Sunday on our Crack Rackets YouTube channel. So if you want to follow everything as it unfolds, tune in to our Crack Rackets broadcast. Jay, what do you have on the horizon this week at No Ad No Problem? Uh... We'll be previewing the Kentucky-Tennessee match on the men's side, so likely determine the SEC conference winner, so look forward to that. I'm looking forward to it, certainly. And again, you can follow the podcast wherever it is you listen to your show. Make sure you go leave it a five-star rating. Make sure you do the same for the Great Shot podcast here as well. Remember, we will be back tomorrow night with Chris Hallioris to break down all the Division One men's action from Week 13. With that said, though, a shout-out, as always, to our super producer, Daniel Westhoff, who makes everything you see on your screen possible for him. My my fantastic co-host John J. Parsons and everyone here at both Crack Rackets and the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. I'm your host, Alex Gruskin. Jay, what do we tell our listeners? Hey, great shot. And we will see you all next week. Thanks, everyone.